Well, greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is so good to be with you this afternoon. It is Wednesday afternoon, and I was not able to uh, make a video yesterday. Um, so I just want to go ahead, though, and connect with what we were doing on Monday in 1 Samuel chapter 30. And I spoke to you about the importance of learning to pastor our own soul. And so let's go ahead and review the scripture that I had been uh, giving us <clears throat> To read, and so I want to go ahead and share my screen with you, and I will uh, read it and then point out three things I want us to see today. So, first of all, we're reading in First Samuel chapter thirty, and this is going to be out of the New Living Translation, right here. Three days later. When David and his men arrived home at their town in Ziklag, they found that the Amalekites had made a raid into the Negev and Ziklag. They had crushed Ziklag and burned it to the ground. They had carried off women and children and everyone else, but without killing anyone. When David and his men saw the ruins and realized what had happened to their families, they wept until they could weep no more. David's two wives, Ahinoam from Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal from Kamal, were among those captured. So I wanna just point this out to you that the situation is that under the circumstances were that David had lost everything. Um, his men had lost everything. They were serving the Lord. They felt like they were supposed to go and do what they were doing. They come back to this place and everything is gone. Um, so they're feeling abandoned by God. They're feeling like uh, um, they weren't uh, able to uh, do any more than what had been done. Um, they're like, where, where do we go wrong? So that's kind of the situation, circumstances. Emotionally, of course, they're in complete distress, uh, grieving. So they get to the place where they have to start pointing fingers. And that's oftentimes what happens when we experience trauma in our lives. Um, <clears throat> we begin to want to point fingers at uh, circumstances or even people. And bitterness can arise in our hearts, which totally poisons relationship. So here's David. He's been with these men who have, uh, he has had incredible feats of victory. Um, the Lord has led them through. Uh, they have been gathering together in a common faith and supporting one another significantly. And all of a sudden, this event, which is incredibly tragic. I mean, there's nothing can be, nothing can overstate what they experienced there. Their houses were burned. Their families were gone. All of their resource had been stolen. So uh, we don't want to understate the, the severity of what they were feeling. But immediately that moment caused bitterness. And so the very family that had been formed uh, among one another as a community of faith was now turning, they were turning against David. Bitterness. And it's interesting that in times of distress, um, things that we've trusted in can be shaken. And that's really what we're walking through today. You know, there's things that are being shaken. What we're used to um, is no longer feeling secure. But isn't it interesting? And I actually have heard some wonderful testimonies that during this time where there seems to be uncertainty, things have been coming to the surface. And there has been difficult times where people have been facing, but there's been times of reconciliation. People are being uh, encouraged to face the pains and the wounds in their own life. And now there's this place of reconciliation. See, we're called to pastor our own souls when these things rise to the top. As the body, we support one another, we pray for one another. Now, I want us to see today how David dealt with this. So let me go ahead and share once again uh, the, uh, the screen. And I want you to see it in two different versions. The, uh, the New Living Translation, as well as the Amplified Version. So here we are, it's highlighted in verse six. Now, David was now in great danger because all his men were very bitter about losing their sons and daughters. And they began to talk of stoning him. But David found strength in the Lord his God. Really honed in on this on Monday. Okay, verse six in the Amplified Version says, further, David was greatly distressed because the people spoke of stoning him, for all of them were embittered, each man for his sons and daughters. But David felt strengthened and encouraged in the Lord his God. So <clears throat> the, the point here I want to make here is 
David strengthened himself in the Lord. He spent time going to this place and experiencing uh, this confidence that he has. Um, and so the word to be strengthened means to be established, to gain confidence in, and of course, to be strengthened. So what are the things that he actually was strengthened in? The word uh, Lord is uh, translated um, in the English from the word Yahweh. Yahweh is the personal covenantal name that God gives to Israel. So this is our first insight that I want us to have regarding how David strengthened himself. And then there's three things. The first one um, we'll start with is the fatherly affection towards God. I like how uh, the, the uh, um, Amplified Version translates it and it says, David felt strengthened and encouraged in the Lord, his God. And I know there, there are some churches that will, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, translations that will uh, say uh, the Lord God. But I like how the Amplified Version really personalizes it. So we need to strengthen our relationship with the Lord and his love, his fatherly affectionate love. We've talked about this a couple of weeks ago. God is good. It's his goodness that gives us boldness and courage. So we need to strengthen ourselves in the affection of God. We talked about the Jesus prayer, praying and stilling our heart. And the affection of God becomes very real to us. I want to encourage you in worship, experience the affection of God. There are so many wonderful verses that teach us about the love and affection of God. First John is all about the love of God, the, the koinonia that we have with God and one another, that incredible forgiveness and mercy, the affection and love. He calls us his beloved. And so begin to get into that place. Um, I want to encourage us even to, to ask the Lord, Lord, would you show me what you see? Would you show me you as a father? Um, maybe some of us can't relate very well because of our past with our natural earthly father. But so then maybe we need to uh, ask God to give us a picture of who he is. But David um, came to this place. He strengthened himself in the affection of the Father. If we could just rest in that. So that's the first thing I want us to see is he strengthened himself. And the second thing is he strengthened himself in the promise. How do I know this? Well, let me show you the screen again. We're going to go to, and what we see is it says in verse seven, when David strengthened himself, it says, then he said to Beathar the priest, bring me the ephod. See that word, the ephod? What I want us to see here is that this is a, a word um, that denotes the garment the priests would wear as they sought the Lord. The ephod, now I'm not suggesting this was the high priest's ephod, but an ephod would have specific in, uh, purpose for the priest to wear, which meant that I am representing the people of God as a priest and uh, petitioning the Lord. A priest is an intercessor. He represents God, but also he represents the people. He's the go-between. We see that with Moses. We see that with the high priests and the priests of the temple. They were the intermediaries between God and man. That's, and the beautiful thing is, is that it says in the New Testament that Jesus Christ is the only mediator between us and God. Jesus becomes our mediator. David is a foreshadowing of this. He says, bring me the garment. So let's clothe ourselves in the garment of what? Of praise. So, and the garment of praise is a declaration of the promises of God. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me. Bless his holy name. Let us not forget all his benefits. For he heals me of all my diseases, forgives me of all my iniquities. That's Psalm 103. We quote that frequently. But think about all the promises. And the ephod um, represents the promise that God has given us in Jesus, that we have an intermediary. But now we, when we put on this garment, we are 
putting on the garment of praise, putting on those promises. We can pray the promises of God on behalf of ourselves and one another. So David strengthened himself in the relationship and the affection of the Father. Then he strengthened himself in the promises that he had received up to this point, that he, that he was taught from the Torah as his father would pass down and the, and, and the religious teachings that he received up to this point, but also the promise that he received from Samuel himself when he, was, when he and when Samuel anointed David eventually to be king, right? So he's, he's, he's reminding us, he's strengthening himself. So here we are at one point saying, seeing that David is afraid in danger for his life because he's being this, made the scapegoat for the loss of all resource family in the city itself. The people wanted to stone him and destroy him. And all relationship up to this point, which was a tight bond, is now non-existent. So David goes to the father and says, Papa, I'm going to strengthen myself in you. All those psalms that he wrote is just coming up in it. And, and, and his emotions are spent. And he strengthened himself in his spirit, soul, and body. And then he reminds himself of the promise. God reminding him, remember, I anointed you, O David, to be king. I anointed you. And so do not fear. So he strengthened himself. And then the third thing, third thing I want us to see is that he strengthened himself in the covenant. Okay, so... What we see here, um, again, I want to share the screen so you can see it, is that uh, the ephod, right? You can see I have highlighted. Um, and so uh, that represents the covenant that God had with Israel. The ephod also, the high priest ephod, although this is not the one, had the high priest had a breastplate where all the 12 uh, 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 Israel tribes of Israel were represented on the breastplate and they were a different color and different type of stone. And each uh, stone of course represented the tr each tribe of Israel. And so, but Abiathar, he brought it. And in verse eight, it says, then David asked the Lord, should I chase after this band of raiders? Will I catch them? And the Lord told him, yes, go after them. You will surely recover everything that was taken from you because I want us to see something here. This is God being true to his covenant. Okay, so go, because I made a covenant with you also, David, that you will be a king. In fact, this covenant that I've made with you is going to be passed down from generation to generation and ultimately fulfilled in Jesus, the son of God. And so the covenant, so he, he strengthened himself in the promise that God had, not just with him and the Father. He strengthened himself in the covenant that he gave to Israel, that he, would, that he promised that there would be a, uh, a Messiah. Now, David didn't necessarily think that he was the Messiah. I want you to understand that. But there was a promise of a Davidic line of kings that would always be on the throne. And little did David know that he was uh, the foreshadowing of Jesus, the ultimate Messiah. So, and David knew there was this covenant with the people of Israel. That's why he's saying, go, go, because everything that has been stolen will be restored. Folks, this is what I declare to you. I want you to hear this. The affection of the Father through Jesus Christ, his love is everlasting. Rest in that. Celebrate in it. Declare it. When you begin to declare it, you begin to feel it. When you begin to feel it, you begin to walk in it. and You begin to express it to other people. And then they're encouraged because you're encouraging yourself. Two, remind yourself of the incredible promises God has made to you. Folks, the, your kids belong to the Lord. You're right. So, so all that has been taken from you personally, I want to just believe with you that the promises of God 
are going to be yes and amen. You're believing for a breakthrough in your life, yes and amen. You're believing for courage, yes and amen. You're believing for financial um, restoration, yes and amen. You're believing for restoration of relationships, yes and amen. And I just want to encourage you, strengthen yourself, build yourself up, be convinced of what God has said already because of his affection, his promises, and then the covenant. The ultimate thing is we have the new covenant in Christ Jesus. This is a, 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 an important point that I want to make to you. The new covenant is between God the Father and his son, Jesus. That's who the new covenant is in. We have been brought in to Jesus Christ. Christ is in me and we are in Christ. So therefore we participate in the new covenant. The hope of glory, Christ in us. So the relationship and covenant that God has with his son, we participate in. The old is gone and the new is come. So all the promises God made to Jesus and the covenant he made to Jesus, we participate in. And we need to strengthen ourselves in this. I'm reminded of a story. And uh, I was talking about somebody today. We're talking about boldness. And there's a couple ways we see, I see boldness. Sometimes I see boldness. Someone is just actually trying to hide their fear, right? They, they, they get themselves revved up with boldness because ultimately they're just trying to overcome their fear and they just as soon run headlong into it um, to overcome that fear. Or a boldness can from, come from peace and God's goodness. And this story goes like this. I can remember um, that Mother Teresa, when she was alive, and I remember hearing stories of when she would meet world leaders, and there was almost a sense of fear that came upon world leaders. World leaders who had the ability to destroy the world several times over with their nuclear arsenal. World leaders that had the, the ability to control people's economic futures and, and to uh, bring about such uh, um, oppression upon people. And Mother Teresa would, who is what, no more than four foot, uh, eight or nine, maybe even less than that, but she would come hunched over with her habit and they would shake hands with her and, and stories that I've read, they would just have a sense of absolute fear and exposure in light of this woman who would just say, peace be with you. I remember a story where she was at a prayer breakfast with national leaders and the president of the United States, and she would just look over, and one time she said, please, stop killing your babies. Give them to me. And just fear would rise up. Here's this woman who has no political power, no resource to her name, nothing to offer and leverage. All she had was the boldness, not from trying to gin it up, but it was a peace because she was strong in the Lord. She had no intention of staring anybody down, but the story goes that she would look world leaders in the eye and they couldn't look her in the eye because she had a covenant that she lived out of, out of Jesus. And there was this peace. So strengthen yourself in the Lord today. Strengthen yourself in his affection, God, the fatherly affection. Strengthen yourself in the, to the promises that you know are true and yes and amen. And then strengthen yourself in the covenants that the father and the son have together. You're in Christ. You are in him. He is your peace. He is your future. Know this. I love you. Elders love you. And let me just pray. Father, God, creator of the heavens and the earth. Father of Abraham, 
Isaac, and Jacob, O Father of Israel, God and Father of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord, we worship you. We worship you for you are and we love you. I pray over every listener to this devotion and I ask that you would bring them into your most precious affection. Let them know your most affectionate passion that you have for them. And may they be reminded of the glorious promises that you have provided for them. The promises of yes and amen in Christ Jesus. And then they know that they get to enjoy that beautiful covenant between you and your son, Jesus Christ. And I thank you for it, Lord. Now let's pray the Jesus prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, son of God, have mercy on me. A child. We love you, Lord. Well, blessings to you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Look forward to seeing you this weekend through our webcast, and I'll give you more information about that tomorrow. Have a great, great 